Well, I, I want to thank Ed and company for inviting me to speak um, and my colleagues that um, were involved in this work. Um, as we've heard today and yesterday, um, the research organization that's, that's organized around the Great Lakes is phenomenal. We know a lot about um, things at large scale through remote sensing. Um, there has been groups that have been very successful at predicting and reporting on the size and the tra trajectory of seasonal blooms in the lakes. And we just heard through the last couple of talks that on the other extreme, we have a lot of knowledge about what's happening at um, biochemical levels and how that can be used to decipher dynamics what I'm going to talk about today may, maybe, I'll say maybe, I'm not going to promise, but it might be a bit of a nexus between the two. So I want to talk a little bit about what we did. Um, these data were collected in um, 2019 and 2022. Uh, put a plug in for the CSMI. Um, this is what's funded my work. Uh, and I think it's valuable for giving us snapshots of more, maybe more in-depth information during periods of time that, that uh, can be melded with other types of data that are collected more routinely. We collected water samples uh, along with NOAA's crew. Um, the samples that we collected uh, were at WAE 4, 2, 6, and 12. So they're a bit biased towards that uh, and, and by design towards the Maumee River and the surrounding waters from that, uh, that uh, outflow. Um, we collected data and they did through um, CTD casts and also water samples that were brought back to the lab. Um, and you can see the things that Noah measured and I'm gonna talk about my counterpart to this. Um, one other thing to mention is um, Vincent, uh, Va uh, Henry Vanderplug, others um, have laid out a seasonal succession of this cyanobacterial uh, assemblage, component of the assemblage, and you can see that it's not a simple one. And uh, it's quite interesting to see how this builds over the course of uh, a typical summer, for instance. So on my part of this, I'm looking at samples microscopically with a variety of different preparations. Um, laborious, but interesting because we learn something by looking at samples directly. Um, uh, we count small cells using epifluorescence, both in the pico and nano size range. Some of these are heterotrophic, some are phototrophic. We can put them into, uh, assign them to categories by what we think we know they belong to in, in terms of phylogenetic groups, but also by their morphology and size. Um, we try to get ambitious uh, and count some of the larger organisms. Some of these in the micro or ciliate um, belongs to this uh, microplankton range, cells that are 20 microns or more. And we do that with settled material with an, uh, with a, an inverted microscope. We can take all these different counts and concatenize them, put them together like a deck of cards. There is some redundancy between them, the, the, the counts that we do, but that's also by design to check to see, are we getting everything? So there isn't much we don't see uh, that we can't count and at least try to identify and categorize them. Um, some things may not preserve, so uh, we may not even get a chance to identify them. But from what we use in standard methods that we've been using for years, we do pretty well and we have um, correlated these with other measures of biomass and it works out pretty well. And you can see that we count uh, in excess of 1500 cells uh, per count. Um, We're also looking at the uptake of carbon and phosphorus. This set of experiments focuses on carbon. We use a radio labeled tracer. We can add it to small vessels. These are scintillation vials. 
and um, we place them or incubate them in this incubator that has 18 different light levels. And um, this we can use to construct a, a photosynthesis irradiance curve. So we can look at the uptake of carbon over time at, at uh, specific wavelengths of, or uh, 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 densities of light, if you will. And so you're looking at this small incubator here that holds the scintillation vials. And you can see that there's various levels of light that we're illuminating with. And to do this and do it in a reasonable way, we incubate these for relatively short periods of time, an hour. Once that hour is up, we can use some basic equations to calculate dis different characteristics of the curve itself. So these are fairly well known. They've been published on for years. And so they provide us some reliable information about not only at the low end of this curve where we see light limited uptake of carbon, but also the light saturated or photo inhibited rate region of this curve by providing a range of light levels that, that we can use as a reconstruction. So people have, um, from the model that we run, we can pull off three main parameters for if, uh, if we actually have photo inhibition, which we did not see in the data I'm gonna show you. But we can get the initial uptake at low irradiance, we can get I sub K, which is important here. It's the shoulder of the curve where it's a transition between low light uptake and, and saturated light uptake. And then P max is the maximum rate of carbon fixation um, once you plateau at the top of this curve. So the other set of experiments we did were a large bottle, a relatively large bottle experiments um, where we're doing these in duplicate bottles, adding a radio tracer, either carbon or phosphorus. We did uh, these in separate experiments. These, these tracers are used at low levels, but they're measurable quite accurately. And um, we can, they don't, dis, they don't cause any imbalance to the carbon chemistry of the water, which is a, a plus. Um, the incubation times for the um, phosphorus uptake were on the order of minutes, usually about 20 minutes. And for the carbon uptake, it was three hours. So now we have two measures, measurements of carbon uptake, one from short incubations, one from these longer in incubations. We post fractionated the water from either phosphorus uptake or, or carbon through 220 and whole samples, and then were used to kind of reconstruct what the uptake rates were at, within these different size fractions of plankton. For the P uptake, it was 210 uh, and a whole sample. All these are assayed using a scintillation counter, and we use standards and blanks to make sure we're accounting for that, tort, that type of background uh, in, interference. Um, in terms of uh, some of the results, these data are from 2019. And what they show us is uh, it's a PCA looking at some basic water quality information. Um, and it shows that we get a trajectory of change through the course of the season, uh, looking at water depth, transmissometry, temperature, and chlorophyll in the water column. We have a grouping of samples that are fairly distinct in April, June, July, August, September, and then June looked a little bit more like October. So we have what looks like a cycle in terms of the physical characteristics within the lake uh, in the areas that we sampled. So the light climate, the temperature, and the level of productivity really uh, could be summarized almost as a water stability versus productivity gradient, a series of, of uh, uh, 
uh, gradient changes through the course of the year. If we look at some of the pigments in the water that we collected, and these are averages taken by date and by station, what we see is we get this kind of characteristic seasonal change from early in the year in May or April. We get a peak in chlorophyll that declines towards uh, the mixing period um, uh, in October. Interestingly enough, phycocyanin shows a very abrupt peak in April and then declines thereafter, at least in this year it did. If we look at the stations, while there is some variation, some of the significant, it's not terribly uh, daunting in any way. So it, there's a fair consistency uh, among the stations, even though there is some, there are some differences. So what I'd say here is we have fairly strong temporal trends and uh, muted, if you would, uh, spatial trends among the stations. We look at the actual samples and these samples have been summarized by calculating uh, percent biomass among the groups of phytoplankton um, what we see is a seasonal progression where cyanobacteria, again, follow fairly closely with the phycocyanin signal, which is good news. And um, we get some blooming of diatoms early on, and it's, it's similar to what Vincent showed, with some diatoms filling in later in the year and a mixed assemblage during the middle of the summer with uh, some fairly strong representation by the cyanobacteria uh, component of the assemblage. If we cluster the species that are present, according to samples, they organize themselves uh, with some coherence, um, where April and August look alike, June, July look alike, September, October looks alike. So again, it almost looks like there's a cycle from beginning uh, in the season to later in the season. We didn't have uh, um, samples uh, uh, from earlier than April or later than October, but uh, within these sampling events, they're organized in, uh, in, a, in a similar way in terms of the species that are present. Carbon uptake. Um, these data are actually looking, uh, depicting the uptake by or among different size categories. And uh, the top graph shows the actual um, rates, if you will, and then the bottom graph shows the relative rates on a percent scale. So we've got our stations here organized according to each of the five sampling dates. These data were from 2019. And what we see are some variation, but fair, again, fair coherence among the stations, some of them different. Um, rates that range between one and about three and a half. And this is in micrograms carbon. And it's also um, relativized to chlorophyll so that these rates are comparable among dates, times, and even to other studies. Uh, that's per liter per hour. The rates seem reasonably typical to what other people have seen, maybe a little bit towards the higher end. Uh, throughout the Great Lakes, many of the carbon production rates regard, you know, may vary uh, with date and so on and station, obviously, but they're probably on the order of one to two. So these rates are a little bit higher and that's expected. If we look at the percent fixation among the categories, this red is uh, less than two, the orange is two to 20 and the yellow is greater than 20. We see that there's more of a shared carbon fixation uh, going on earlier in the year and that that diminishes and is dominated by larger cells. 
and um, most of these being cyanobacteria. It starts to change again back uh, to a more mixed uh, carbon uh, uptake uh, scenario as we move into October. The data I'm gonna show now are from 2022. And this also shows a seasonal trend in chlorophyll. These data are depicted a slightly different way. We, we ran them through the same series of, of screens. So we're able to look at size structure. And if you look to the, to the left there, you'll see carboys that were collected the water that's collected, and you can see the difference just in the color between these samples. These were the, um, the August samples here. Uh, that's WLE2, that's in the plume of the Maumee River. WLE4 is at the beyond that plume, so it's clear water, relatively clear water. This is Lake Erie after all. And six, which is kind of part of the southern trajectory of that plume, that mixing zone to the south. And then 12 is a little bit beyond that. So we've got a good contrast of samples. These numbers look for chlorophyll, look low, but they're, they're not. Um, they're still reasonably high numbers. It's just they're daunted by the bloom that we captured in August. Uh, and you can see two and four had tremendous uh, uh, bloom of algae. That declined afterwards. And what I wanna show is that you can really see this in the size fractionated chlorophyll where uh, that size fraction greater than 20 really is dominant in the middle of the year. These are some PI curves. Uh, pre, during, and post at WLE6. You can see they're higher, and this is fairly typical early in the year. During the bloom, they're actually lower. During that bloom, afterwards, they're higher still. And you can see the average values for Pmax, alpha, and I sub K. And I'm gonna summarize those in a little bit here to, to make some sense out of it if, if we can. The size specific uptake looks different, somewhat similar, some similar patterns. The rates were a little bit lower in this year, but certainly within the range. And you'll notice that all the rates during that bloom are low, relatively low. In some cases, almost half of what they were during the other two periods. We also have uh, larger cells that dominate the uptake rates. If we correlate the bottle experiments to the PI curves, because they're different independent experiments, we get good relationship and that's promising. We can estimate that and use that to look at gross versus net production. The last thing I'm gonna talk about are these uptake rates for phosphorus. This shows an opposite pattern with peaks during the high bloom period dominated by larger cells. The only difference is that we do see this kind of uh, pr persist into that later sampling period. So phosphorus is being taken up um, to a greater extent during the bloom. So to kind of tie this together, what we're finding is that phosphorus uptake is negatively cor correlated to carbon uptake. And while this may, it may not be intuitive, it has been shown before that these processes compete often with one another. As cells store phosphorus or take up large amounts of phosphorus, they may diminish their rate of carbon fixation. Phycocyanin is negatively correlated with I sub K, which means that cells as these blooms get bigger, they become a little bit more efficient at using light. That shoulder of that curve 
right, is lower. So they're using light more efficiently. And then finally, P uptake is correlated with phycocyanin. It goes up. So what does this mean? I guess a reasonable hypothesis would be as seasonal blooms develop in Lake Erie, the efficient use of light, lower I sub K, by cyanobacteria enhances their affinity for phosphorus uptake. And that is a light-related reaction. It can be. And it's at the expense of carbon uptake. So that's what I got. I got to just show this slide and let you look at it. But that is just a thank you to Gloro. They've been present throughout my career. Thank you.